do I look like some mean cult leader now? Yeah. It's Sunday night, <laughs> and we're here to talk about the history of Israel. We're, and why are we talking about Israel's history as a nation? That's because everything that happened in Israel when they were a nation from around in the 1096 B.C., that's about the time that Saul became king. Before Saul was king, Samuel was uh, the mouth of the Lord. Samuel was the prophet of God. And of course, you had many of these major prophets as they would go along here in in 1 Samuel, of course, Samuel, uh, Samuel's mother asked for a son, and she said, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you, God. And, of course, in around 1096, that's in the 8th chapter of 1 Samuel, that's when Saul, uh, the people said, give us a man to be king over us. Now, the reason man can't be king, the Bible says in the 12th chapter of Samuel, of 1 Samuel, that God was the king of Israel. And if, when God is king, he sets up the laws himself. When man is king or man is ruler, when he rules his own life, man interprets, he writes down the laws he wants. And when he writes down the laws he wants, what he's doing is interpreting them for himself and says, since I wrote my laws down and since this is my God, of course, Israel got involved in dead gods that had no breath. And when a man says, since this is my God, it's the God of self that I've invented, then he can write the laws down the way he wants to and he can interpret them for himself. Well, of course, the whole purpose, and I'm going to repeat this till it's coming out of our ears, the whole reason that we're studying the kingdom of God for a 500-year period, 500 years, they were actually a king for a kingdom for about 800, 850 years, but for about 350 years, 350 years, they were under judges, and of course, the reason they were under judges is because they did not drive the sun worshipers out of Israel when they came into Israel, so came back to Israel after having been 400 years in bondage. Right before they were under judges, they were 40 years in the wilderness and 400 years in Egypt, and God brings them out to the hand of Moses, and when they come back, he says, you had a father over here, Abraham, I gave the land to, go in and possess the land. And he said, drive out these unbelievers. I don't want you intermarrying with them. Intermarriage has nothing to do with black marrying white or red marrying yellow. It has to do with belief marrying a lie. That's what it has to do with. And the reason we're studying Israel's 500-year uh, time as a kingdom is because all prophecy, all prophecy has to do with the conversion of Israel over a time period that's going to go all the way to the end of time. And on Sunday mornings, we're preaching about this. It's called the 70 weeks of Daniel. And God measures out a time period till the end of time to convert Israel from their Baal worship, Baal. Of course, Baal, that seems like some, who in the world is Baal? That's some old, some old ancient God of the ancient world. Baal was the sun god. He was the, he was the sun. Baal was a generic term. It means the Lord. The Lord, when you see that attached to a word or to a person's name, it just means the Lord. Uh, and then, of course, they went after the grove, and God said, I've got one, two, three, four judgments, sword, famine, pestilence, and the beast. The beast is the world system. I'll come to you. If you go after another God and you're not obedient to me, I'll send the sword, the famine, the pestilence. And people say, what's the difference between the sword and the beast? The sword was where God would take a town in Israel and surround it by armies and cut off all the roads in and all the supply lines in. And then he said, I'll cut off all these roads and after about a month, I'll cause you to eat your children. Well, Israel got to eating their children and people get mad at that. I'm not going to go into that tonight. But the reason I'm teaching on, on, the, on the, the, uh, the kingdom of God, kingdom of God was an old ancient term for Israel. Why wouldn't it be called kingdom of God? Everyone else in the world was worshiping some form of the sun god when Jesus was here. 
uh, the only nation in the world that was worshiping Jehovah God was Israel. They're there on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Everyone else, whether it was Syria, or Ethiopia, or Egypt, or whether it was uh, uh, ancient Babylon, of course, Babylon is in the land of Iraq, or Syria, or whatever it was, everyone else was worshiping some form of a virgin-born sun god. So when the Jews said, we're worshiping this uh, Jesus who was born of a virgin, the reason the Jews wouldn't accept that is because they worshiped, they worshiped uh, Adonis up here in Greece, or they worshiped Tammuz down here in Babylon, or they worshiped Osiris over here in Egypt, and these were all forms of the sun god, and that went back to the original Babel system, and that Babel system was begun by Nimrod, and his mother deified him as the child of the sun and said he was virgin born. So it all goes back to that. And that's why they didn't want to believe uh, that Jesus was virgin born. Israel got involved in this, and everything before their time as a nation, God arbitrarily takes one man, Abraham, in this lineage of Seth, who traces all the way back to Adam and comes down through Noah, and then his descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Everything before Israel was a nation pointed to them as a nation, and everything after they were a nation pointed to them as a nation. And then you had the in the last days, or the last days, the last days does not mean the last hundred years or the last 75 years. A day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. And in Acts, the second chapter, Peter said, when he stood there at Pentecost, he said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel that in the last days, the Lord would do this, would pour out of his spirit in the, in the, and the spirit is the truth that he would pour out of his spirit on all flesh or on the Gentiles as opposed to the one flesh, the Jewish flesh that he had given it to. So the whole point of Israel, they weren't obedient to God during this time period. So God says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a time period called the last days from Acts 2 where I'm going to open the hearts of the Gentile church. So the last days is the last 2,000 years you got two sets of a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. And what we're looking for is God coming up with a spiritual Israel. A Jew is not outwilly by the heart, Paul said. And Paul said, we are the circumcision, which was a term for the Jews. He said, we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit. We trust in Christ and we have no confidence in the flesh there in Philippians 3. What are you shaking your head no for? Thank you, Spirit. What? Spiritual. A U L. I'm like the guy that spelled. He called one day and he said, he was really a bad speller. He said, oh, I can't remember what it was. He put A U or E U or something. Strange. strange. I get some strange spellers. Okay, well, I, I'll get it right here in a minute. <laughs> I'm too close to the board. I can't spell this close to the board. When I get up this close, it's like, oops, what is that? I usually don't pay attention to what I've written down. Now, the last 2,000 years, that's when God will call the spiritual Jew, according to the second chapter of Romans, the third chapter of Romans, the ninth chapter of Romans, the eleventh chapter of Romans, when he says, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And we're children by, of Abraham by faith, and we're spiritual Jews, circumcised of the heart. We're the temple of God. We are God's priests and kings. Everything that was once a shadow over here, what God is doing, the shadow, and then you have the very image over here, very image there in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, the first verse. The shadow was the Old Testament, the very image. When you go out in the sunshine, and you and the sun shines on you and it's two o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to cast a shadow and you are the image where the sun, you block the light of the sun and you cast this shadow, which is the real, the shadow or the image. The real is the spiritual. So the spiritual Jew, the spiritual temple of God is real. And as we study 
this, this time of Israel from 1 Samuel uh, up through 2, well, actually through Nehemiah as we've been seeing, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, that's the time period of Israel's history upon the earth. And then they have a period after Nehemiah called between the Testaments or the Maccabees, and that's about a 400 years of silence. And then you go into, into, uh, uh, you go into Matthew, and people will say, yeah, but Nehemiah, Esther, and then Job comes, and Job is preceding that. After you leave Esther, everything is no longer in sequence as far as chronological time order is concerned. Now, what we're doing, we're going through the kings of Israel. And the reason we're going through it is we want to see, is we want to see, watch these kings fall. We're watching them fall one right after the other, uh, all the way through the books of the kings. And when I say books of the kings, to the Jew, First and Second Samuel, as well as First and Second Kings, as well as First and Second Chronicles, that was all the books of the kings. They actually had six books of the kings. And that was, it's called the books of the kings because it's the history of Israel's time as a kingdom upon the earth. And it was all about the land that God gave them. And that's the reason we're having all this problem over there right now. It's over the land. That's why when we look at the, uh, when we look up here at the Gaza Strip right here, we see the Gaza Strip and then we see the West Bank. This is where the Palestinians are occupying in the Gaza Strip. Gaza was one of the old ancient cities of the Philistines and Palestinian or Palestine comes from the word Philistine and the Philistine occupied what we call the Gaza Strip and that was the old ancient land of the Philistines. And of course in 1948 when Israel possessed the land one more time and the National Council at Tel Aviv met, and they were declared to be a nation for the first time in 2,600 years, the Palestinians, the next day on May 15th, 1948, Israel tells Palestine, or they told them the day before that, said, we'll give you some land and call it your land, but they didn't want that. They wanted the entire nation, so Israel, so they gave them, of course, the next day, the Palestinians declared war against Israel, not only the Palestinians, but all of the Arab world, Egypt attacked from the south, Jordan attacked from the uh, east, and then from the north came Syria and all the other Turks in the nation. And, uh, and when this happened, uh, Israel, after that first war of independence, Israel gives the Palestinians, they don't give them the land, but they allow them to live in the West Bank and they allow them to live in the Gaza Strip, but Israel is the one who owns it. And all of this is about the fact that while they were a nation, they went after idol gods, and God said, I'll send the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast will not be the sword just to siege. The beast will pick up Israel, carry them away, and take them into Babylon. We'll take them over into Babylon, and they'll be there for 70 years, and I don't need to go into that. Listen to the tapes from the last four or five Sunday mornings. Now, the reason we're studying it is to watch the kings fall. They keep going back to Baal and the grove. This is the system that Constantine brought into the church. It's the fire worship of Babel. It's the fire worship of Babel. Uh, of course, Babel began this system in the 11th chapter of Genesis and then it was uh, carried to the Assyrian Empire. And when I say Babylon, I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about the empire alone, and I'm not talking about the city alone. The Babylonian Empire, I've got a map that I drew up years ago on this. Let me see if I've got it back here. Uh, I'm always talking about the beast system. If y'all will forgive me a moment, I think I've got it. I think, yeah, here it is. I think, yeah. I think, hold on. Yeah, here it is. When Israel was carried away into captivity, I need to, re, to redraw this. 
but you've got Babel in Genesis 11, 4. And of course, the Bible says Babylon was the mother of all harlots. The word harlot is P-O-R-N-N-E-I-A, and that word means idolatry. Idolatry, and we get our word pornography from that. It doesn't merely mean to look at a naked woman. It means to look at something. It means idolatry. Of course, idolatry is a construction of the word. It is the word E-I-D-O-L-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-I-A. E I A. Okay, that is the word idolatry, and it comes from E I D O and L A T R E U O. Ido means to see or perceive, and latrio means to serve. Now, when you are involved in idolatry, you you serve what you look at, and when we look at all these billboards, and they always have to put a naked woman up there by a uh, by a uh, Chevy pickup truck in order to sell it. They have to put a naked woman up there, one scantily clad up there by a Bud Light. That's the only way they can sell it. Well, what we're, what we're fulfilling is what our eyes are looking at, and of course that causes covetousness to come into our life. And covetousness is idolatry, and the word covetous is P-L-E-O-N-E-K-T-E-S, and that word pleonectes, covet, a covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3 and 5, and, and Ephesians uh, 5 and 5, the Bible says a covetous man is an idolater, and covetous pleonectes means want more. Now, how many people here have wanted more? If you've ever wanted more of anything, you are an idolater, Jim Brown. Let me get over there where I can look in the mirror, see that reflection of me. So, a covetous man is an idol worshiper. Well, that's the beginning of the Baal worship. Baal was not merely something that started at Babel. That was the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. It didn't start at Babel. I'm getting, this thing's getting messy up here. Let me erase some of this. Here's the whole point of studying Israel's idolatry. When they went after Baal, let me try to explain this. I'm always talking about this, and I can't quite get it over to people. I really want to, I try so hard, and if one of y'all can help me explain it, or you have some ideas how to explain it. When I'm talking about Christmas being idolatry, Christmas, Constantine 325, A.D. at the Nicene Council, at the Nicene Council, that's where Roman Catholicism began. That's where it began. The very crux, the very essence of Roman Catholicism is the Mass. The Mass. Everything else in Roman Catholicism is built around the Mass. Now, Gerald was raised Roman Catholic. I don't know if you remember that much, but wouldn't you say that's true? Yeah. That is, everything's yeah. built around the Mass. It doesn't matter the rosary, uh, the confessional. The very, the very essence of Roman Catholicism is the Mass. Well, the Mass is eating human flesh. It's what it is. You go to a Catholic church three times a day, four times, how many ever masses some local Catholic church will have, and they raise the little round cracker, the little round Eucharist up in the air, and they say it turns into the literal body of Christ. And then they eat that, and they say, they say, this is what Jesus was saying when he said, take, eat, this is my body. That's not what he was saying because they were eating the Passover when he said that. And the body of Christ is the church, and that was figurative or abstract language or terminology. And, of course, he tells us what uh, eating of the body, eating his flesh, means. He says, my flesh is meat indeed. Flesh is or equals meat indeed. And my blood is drink, blood is or equals, equals drink indeed. Well, all you have to do to want to know what Jesus was saying is define the word indeed. Eating flesh 
is indeed. Drinking blood is indeed. Indeed is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-S. Alethes, and alethes is the word of truth. You eat and drink of truth, eat flesh and drink blood was an old ancient term. It meant to partake in a slaughter. And you find that very, that very phrase in the 39th chapter of Ezekiel where the Lord speaks of destroying the armies of the earth and he calls all the fowls of the air when you've got millions of dead people out there. You don't bury them and God says, I've got a way to dispense with all these dead bodies. I will call the fowls of the air the eagles and the vultures and the osprey and all these flesh-eating birds, and I'll say, eat flesh and drink blood at the table that I have prepared for you. It meant to partake in a slaughter. And you say, how is it that when we eat of truth, we partake in a slaughter? Because when you tell truth, you anger the world and they call you names like they did Jesus and like they do me. All I'm doing is revealing truth and laying it out before people, and they call Jim, every, Jim Brown every kind of name in the world, and they want to kill me. I guess I've got, I've probably got at least a thousand enemies that would like to see me dead. In fact, I have people that hate me so bad, they want to see me dead, they didn't want to come out and jump up and down on my grave and go, you know, that's how bad they hate me. What about the ones that want to save you? Yeah. <laughs> And it's utterly amazing to me. I'll define words all night long, and they're saying, that cult. Cult? Why don't you go down and throw the English teacher out of the school? Go get rid of the math teacher. They're revealing facts. Call them a cult when you reveal facts. It's idiocy. The world is nuts. Isn't it? <laughs> Doug was going... <laughs> They call me crazy because I define words. If you refuse word definition or you refuse a participle or an infinitive or a noun or a direct object or a predicate nominative, you're nuts. <laughs> Isn't that true? That's crazy. I'll be 63 this next week, and I am still, after 45 years of studying the Bible, I'm as frustrated as I ever was that you can say two plus two is four, and man has to take his cross and die. Well, I'll take that two plus two is four, but I don't know about this other down here. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Good grief. Charlie Brown, good night. And you know what frustrates me? I was sitting at dinner talking. I know what it is that frustrates me. Some old drunken truck driver who cusses like a sailor don't, don't frustrate me. I can accept that. Some guy says, I'm just a pagan, and I drink, and I carouse and chase women. I said, I can accept that. What bothers me is a man who carries his Bible in his hand and says, I believe it. And you say, hand it to me. Let me read you something out of your Bible and define the words out of your Bible. They go, I don't believe that. Well, here's your Bible back. If I go back in, if I go into somebody's house, I like to say, hand me your Bible. And I say, okay, look here in your Bible, Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Look at there, isn't that great? Can I mark this in your Bible? Give me that yellow highlighter. I wouldn't even have to open that up in his Bible and say, oh my gosh, there's that verse. Oh, I wish I hadn't let him mark that with that highlighter. <laughs> Got to face it. Now, I will do that to somebody. I'll say, hand me your Bible. And then I'll open it up and say, don't you like this? 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, we're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Isn't that great? Give me that highlighter. I love that. I love John 5, 21. As the Father quickens the dead, even so the Son quickens whom he wills. He don't quicken according to your will. He quickens whom he wills. He makes alive who he wants to. That's the truth. Now, this mass, I was going to tell you, this, I'm trying, the mass is eating human flesh. When Constantine brought this into the church, he didn't reach back to the birth of Christ. Do I, when I say these things, do I believe in the birth of Jesus? Well, certainly I believe in the birth of Jesus. Do I believe that Jesus is God in the flesh? Well, certainly I believe in that. I'll tell somebody I don't believe in Christmas, they'll say, do you don't believe in Jesus? No, no, I believe in him more than you do. I believe he's God. He is born of a virgin, and we have to do what he says. And he says, I'm the God of the Old Testament. Therefore, shall you keep an ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. 
Don't do it. And then people say, well, we're going to do it, but we don't do it that way. God said, don't do it. But they do. So here's the whole point about... We got a case about that. Is Christmas in the Bible? Is Christmas in the Bible, yeah. So when Constantine starts the Roman Catholic Church, he builds everything around the mass that's eating human flesh. Well, he didn't go back to the birth of Jesus. Constantine was losing the empire. The vandals were raging across Europe. All of the different hordes of all kinds were, were going across what we call the European continent, and they were about to take over the empire, and Constantine said, I've got to do something. I will take the God of the sun worshipers, sun worship, and I will take Christianity, and I will amalgamate the two and weave them together so I can conciliate the heathen and I can conciliate Christianity and I have both of them involved in one and I will reach back to the old ancient pagan world, the same system that polluted Israel, Hercules worship, his birthday was December the 25th, that's why he's brought in the church. I will go back to the ancient world, I will bring the grove in, which is the tree goddess, and we will implement that into the church, and that's where the Christmas tree comes from, Christmas tree, and I will bring this into the church, and that tree worship, you can find that in Jeremiah 10, Isaiah 44, Jeremiah 44, and everywhere you find the word grove, the Asherah, A-S-H-E-R-A-H, that means upright. Now, what, that's what Constantine brought in the church, and he said, I will put the halo, I will put the sun god behind the heads of the saints. That way, when the sun worshipers see their god behind the head of Jesus, when they see the sun god behind the head of Jesus, they will feel comfort comfortable in worshiping the god of the Christians. And when the Christians see the halo or the sun god, behind the heads of their saints, they will feel comfortable allowing the two to be amalgamated and come together. That's what Constantine brought in the church. It's the same system that while Israel was a nation and all the kings, all of these kings were falling into this worship, all of them kept going back to Baal. That's the same system that started at Babel, at Babel, and then later on, it was the Assyrian Empire, and Assyria was identified slash with the Babylonian Empire, and then Babylon was overthrown by Persia, and the Medes, and then Persia was overthrown by the Greeks, by the Greeks, and then the Greeks were overthrown in the 4th century B.C. by the Romans. And this is the Babylonian lion there in Daniel 7, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, and Rome being a composite of these three. And then this Roman Empire was outlawed. This was the deadly wound that was healed because it was outlawed for about 27 years and then it was re-implemented into the Roman Catholic Church. And the title of the Pontifex Maximus, Pontifex Maximus or Maximum High Priest, that was the title of the high priest of the Babylonian, Persian, Greeks, and Roman Empire when they were in sun worship. And if you turn on an old TV if you'll turn on an old TV movie, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. They will talk about, oh, uh, the, the Caesar was the child of the sun, and he is a god in the flesh. And that's where this came from. And this is the system that goes all the way back to Babel. And when Nimrod started Babel, his mother, Semiramis, S-E-M-I-R-A-M-I-S, 
Semiramis, she deified Nimrod in the stars as Orion or Hercules, the great giant hydra or serpent killer, which was a perversion of Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So he was deified as the Messiah as the false Messiah, and the verses that were used to magnify Christ were used in, his, in the place so it could deify him. And out of Nimrod at Babel came Hercules or Adonis or Achilles, and Achilles has the weak heel, and you get into that. That's just another perversion of Genesis 3.15. So when a man gets involved in sun worship or Baal worship, he's involved in the system at Babel. But here's the whole point. The point is this, and I've been trying to explain this to a long time for people. When you get into anything else except Jehovah worship, what you're into, you're into making a new God so you don't have to take the Word of God and do exactly what He says and crucify self, take your cross daily, deny self, that you don't have to suffer for righteousness' sake. You come up with a Jesus that's not the Jesus of the Bible. You've got to remember this. Jesus is the word Iesus, I-E-S-O-U-S, I-E-S-O-U-S, Iesus in the Greek. And Iesus means Savior. And Hercules of Babel, or Nimrod, was called the Savior or the Jesus of the ancient world. But that's not the Jesus of the New Testament. That's not the Jesus who was born of a virgin. That Jesus is a false Jesus. That's the Jesus that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 11 and 4 when he says, Some will come preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel that I have not preached. That other Jesus has been around, not just since Babel. Here's the point of it all. When Babel was begun, Babel started on the Euphrates River. This is where the Babylonian Empire began. Here's Persia, here's Iraq, here's the Persian Gulf, Iran, Syria, Saudi Arabia. When you go just northwest of the Persian Gulf, the Euphrates and the Tigris split about 100 miles up there. Euphrates goes south. And the capital city of the Babylonian Empire was here at Babylon. The capital city was the head of the whole empire. And that's the same place where the Tower of Babel was built. And, that, and when God planted a garden eastward in Eden, there in the second chapter of Genesis, the boundaries of Eden was the great Nile River of Egypt and the Euphrates and the Tigris River. So eastward in Eden, the garden, the garden that was in Eden was over here at Babel. When they started, when they started the Babel system, which was the Babylonian system, which is the mother of idolatry, it was all founded. It was all founded upon the system that began at Babel. When you study the Babel system, that was the reinstitution of Adam and Eve worship. That's what it was. And all of this about Babel or Babylon began in the garden. And it's very simple. When God says to Adam and Eve, Thou shalt not, that's his commandment. He says, You eat. Let me just go ahead and finish this. I have, sometimes I get real puzzled. You have to think abstract. When you think concrete, concrete is looking for something solid to base everything on. Abstract is looking where something can apply many places, and it doesn't apply only in one area. Concrete means, if baptism means to dip in water, then that's it. It's over. Brick wall. You can't go any further. But then when John the Baptist came preaching, uh, I baptize with water, but there comes one after me, I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's abstract language. You cannot even get to that. 
you can't get any further than just, if it's just H2O, that's the end of the sentence. But it's not. If there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and I'm not going to go into that, when did the water cease? It did cease. Because if there's one baptism, it is either H2O or it is Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we're not talking about Pentecostalism. The Spirit is the truth. It's being baptized in truth. Where was I going? Okay, Babel. Here's the point. Babel. Assyria, Babylon, Rome, uh, Persia, Greece, Persia, Greece. This is the world beast system. The beast has always been here, Rome. The beast is not a future thing. And then Babel, that was the reinstitution of Adam and Eve worship. And the sign of Adam and Eve was the, was the sign of the woman. This is called the sign of Venus. It's also called the sign of Adam and Eve. Well, this goes back. Sometimes there was a variation of this. Sometimes the cross was put in the middle of, the, of this, and sometimes you had a variation of this. You had the, what they called the Maltese cross, and you find this in all the ancient systems of the world. You find it on the American Indian. You find it on the Hindus. You find it... Uh, it is the, actually a variation of the fire wheel, and of course the fire wheel was nothing but the swastika in the ancient world. That's what's called the fire wheel, or it was called the wheel of life, or called the wheel of the year, or the nature wheel, and that was supposed to be the sun, or the, the sun moving uh, counterclockwise and giving the crops to all of the land of the ancient world. I've got a, I've got a uh, book here. A uh, witch's book that even the witches know what it is. Here is the here is the swastika, the fire wheel of the ancient world. <laughs> he, he's interested in this, aren't you? Okay, here it is, right here. And when you go into this and show people this, they all go berserk and say, "What are you making all this up?" Yeah, I, all those books I've got in my library upstairs all made up. I just invented it. Here's. <laughs> Here's the swastika right here, and that's the fire wheel. And that's one of the things, that's called the nimbus. When it's put behind the heads of the saints, in this form, it's called the nimbus. When it's just a circle, that's the sun god. This is what Israel was involved in, and we watch all of these kings fall. And of course, here, what Hitler did, he turned it around. When you put the swastika with the arms going clockwise, that's supposed to go against all nature. This was the Boy Scout symbol of the Boy Scouts of America in the 20s with a fleur de lis right in the middle of it. Now, people can get mad at that or not. That's, you can get that on the Internet. And you're going to get mad at me for, don't say the Boy Scouts use a swastika. I didn't say that. In 1924, that was their symbol. <laughs> Isn't it funny? I get my encyclopedias out. We can put them all over these. Say, look at this interesting thing. Oh, I don't like that. Go tell the historians that. Don't tell me. Boy Scouts give you a bag for being a, for being a, for being a good fire wheel worshiper. But you'll notice harvesting, fallow, growing, planting, and what was the first judgment of God? Famine. Famine. And then you've got eight points on the swastika. Eight points. These are the same eight points. The same eight points. Look here. Let me see if I can find it. I didn't mean to even get into this, but sometimes just helping everybody understand. I've got, where's my book? I'm looking for my, uh, I'm, only me and the Lord knows, that's right. I'm looking for my Catholic book. Huh? The one with the, cracker on it. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's the, the, the huh? Yeah, that's it. There's the, there's the Eucharist where you eat human flesh, and when you look at it close, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's got eight points on it. These are the eight points of the ancient nature wheel, and there it is right there. That's what this is, and these are the eight seasons. And one of the seasons was Yule, 
and Yule predates Yule predates Christ's name. predates the birth of Christ. 1,500, 2,000 years. This is a good Catholic book right here. This is a Catholic book. It's a Roman Catholic book. You can go down to Books of Million if you're a good Catholic, and this will tell you what you believe. This is not a book to speak against Catholicism. It speaks for Catholicism. Then when you, when you open this up, and it will speak about the Christmas altar, then it will say before Christianity. That's the way they start this. Before Christianity... The Christmas season was celebrated in Europe as the Feast of the Yule. The Yule meant wheel. And the Yule, at one time, the entire swastika was called the fire wheel or Yule. I didn't make that up. You can get that out of any number of dozens of history books at every library in the world. But they want to get mad at me because you got swastikas 2,000 years before Jesus. You're talking about Hitler's. And, and the wreath comes from the fire wheel, and what's hanging on your front door when you put a wreath up is a swastika, a fire wheel. That's what they roll down the hill in the Scandinavian countries, in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. They would roll a fire wheel down so far, and if it reached to a certain point, as it was on fire, they would say they would have good crops in the spring. This is what Israel is involved in. <sighs> And here's a variation, here's a variation of the fire wheel. Look, it's grain. It's about food. It's about eating. This is called the bridge cross. That's what they call the swastika in Britain a thousand years before Jesus. That's what the Celts called it. Why do I get frustrated? Because I did not write these books. Celts worship Baal too. Yeah, they do. The Celts worship Baal. They sure do. And Yule was around long before. So here's the point. I try to explain this. When Israel was a nation, they became involved when this fire worship, all the nations that surrounded Israel, was worshiping some form of Nimrod, who was deified in the stars as the sun god, as the child of the sun, as the great serpent killer, the hydra killer. That's really Jesus, and he was all sun worship. Roman Catholicism, when it was brought into the Catholic Church, it's all, all the nations were worshiping some form of that. They had a sun god and a tree goddess that was the consort or the wife. In Egypt, you had Isis, who was the virgin mother, Osiris, the virgin-born son, or Ra, or Amun. They had many of the sun gods in that system. You would have over here in what we call Jordan in the ancient world, it was the land of Ammon and the land of Moab. Moab worshipped Molech or Moloch. That was the sun god. In Nor excuse me, Moab worshipped Shemosh, C-H-E-M-O-S-H, C-H-E-M-O-S-H. And that in the word S-H-E-M-E-S-H, that is one of the words for sun in the Hebrew. And then northern Jordan worshipped, northern Jordan worshipped Moloch or Milcom or Malcolm or Molech, and that was just their form of the sun of God. And then in what we call Beirut, Lebanon, that was the old ancient land of Tyre, they worshipped Hercules, and when Jezebel married Ahab, they brought that system of Hercules into Israel and retitled it Baal, and the female deity up here Jezebel's father was a priest of Baal and a priest of the Ashtaroth. And the Ashtaroth were all the female deities, and she was represented by the tree, and she was brought into Israel and called the grove. And that system traces back to Babylon since Ethbaal, the father of Jezebel, was a priest of Baal, and he was also a priest of the Ashtaroth, the tree goddess. That's the same system that polluted Babylon that Cyrus came in and destroyed Babylon and drove it out, and the Chaldean fire worship found its seat in Pergamos there in Revelation 2.13. People are mad at me because I'm making this up, but here's the thing. And, of course, it left Pergamos. The king of Pergamos, Italus III, died and left that system to Rome, and an Olympic torch 
carried that fire, that eternal fire, out of the temple of Asclepius, the serpent god, the first place we see the sun god behind the heads of the saints, the first time we see the, the sun god behind the head of anything, it's behind the head of Asclepius, the serpent god of the Pergamum Empire, and it was carried by a torch as an eternal flame, it was carried over to Rome into the temple of Mithra, and as an eternal flame, it found its seat there, and the keepers of the flame were the Vestal Virgins, which developed into the nuns of the Roman Catholic Church, and that's why, that is why John Kennedy has an eternal flame at his grave. That's fire worship. And people are mad at me. Today's Mother's Day, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Day, yeah. Mother Mary. Well, <laughs> it all goes back to paganism. Now, here's the thing. When it started, it started in the garden. And I really want to say this. When Adam and Eve, it all started when Satan deceived Eve and he whispered in her ear and said, Go eat of my Go eat of my food on the other side of this, of this C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. -A -A. Now, the word mark, the word mark, the word mark is the word karagma in the Revelation, the 13th chapter. The mark of the beast, the word mark comes from the word C-H-A-R-A-X, which is a stake on a boundary line. It's a stake on a boundary when the mark of the beast is not future. The mark, if the beast was here, Babylon, the lion, the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, there in Daniel 7, and Rome, a composite of these, developed into Roman Catholicism, all they did was change the names of the icons of the statues in the niches. They renamed Jupiter Peter and renamed uh, the Venus or Aphrodite of the pagan world renamed her Mary. And they said Aphrodite, which means wrath subduer, could subdue the wrath of her son in the ancient world. That's why, when the, that's why the Mary of Roman Catholicism, you're supposed to pray to her so she can subdue the wrath of her son, Jesus. Jesus is the one with compassion. He is our mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, not the Virgin Mary. She's not a virgin. She had other sons in, uh, there in the sixth chapter of Mark. So they've got the perennial virgin following the perennial virgin of the old pagan world. Here's the whole thing about fire worship. It started in the garden when Eve looked at the tree. And we were talking about idolatry, covetousness being, being idolatry. When a man doesn't want to do the things that God says, here's what he does. When he don't want to, when he doesn't want to be obedient to God, he goes across into the mark of the beast. He goes over here. God says, don't cross this boundary line. Don't eat of this tree over here. You eat here in my law in my instruction. This is what Israel became involved in. I am not saying that a man actually bows down to a tree and says, Oh, hell, O oh tree. O oh, tree, the savior of my soul. That's not what he does. He does what Eve and Adam did in the garden. When they say we don't do it that way, they're trying to say we don't bow down to a tree and call out to the sun. Neither did Adam and Eve when they started this thing. America is doing it the same way Adam and Eve did it. When Adam and Eve started, they simply looked to self. They didn't say there was any other God. And when Satan came to Eve in the form of the serpent, he didn't say there was another God. He said, hath God said. He didn't say there wasn't a God. He said there is a God, and then all he did was put in question God's commandment. That's all. 
He said, did God say you couldn't eat of any of these trees in the garden? He knew better than that. God said, don't eat of this tree over here and go into the mark of the beast. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He was the beast that ruled in the garden. The beast is a world-ruling system. What ruled in the garden? The serpent. Didn't he? Huh? Yes, you are. <laughs> the serpent ruled in the garden, and what did he say? He put in question God's words. When people say we don't do it that way, they're trying to say we don't bow to a tree. We don't worship the sun and say, Hail to thee, O sun. Neither did Adam and Eve. What they did, 1 John 2, 1 John. Here's what they did. This is what all idolatry is built upon since Babel started in the garden. Look at 1 John 2, 16, not 2, 22, 2, 16. Look at 1 John 2. When man goes after another god like Israel went after, all the time that Israel was a nation, they went after these other gods. And look at 1 John I don't know what made me get on this tonight, but here's the whole point. Huh? You're crazy. I know what, I'm crazy. Everybody says I am, so I must be. Mother's Day message. Yeah, Mother's Day message. Yeah. <laughs> mother. It's about uh, the Virgin Mother Mary. Yeah. Now, 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. This was Eve's message from Satan right here. All that is in the world. When a man goes lusting after the world, all in the world. Here's everything in the world. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The word lust is E-P-I, T-H-U-M-I-A. This is where the tree worship started. Epithumia, epi means to superimpose thumos. Epithumia, the word lust, means to long for that which is forbidden. That started in the garden. Thumos means to breathe hard. Epi means to superimpose breathing hard after or longing after that which is forbidden when a person will say, I, I, want, I want that car. I, I want that ring. I, 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 want, I, I just can't wait to get my Christmas presents. I can't wait to get that gift. I, can't, I, want, I, I want her. I want him. I want, I want what I want. That is tree worship. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. It is of the world. Let's go back to Genesis 3. This is what Israel became involved in. Anytime you get involved in tree worship, it has nothing to do with bowing down to a tree, even though people say, we don't bow down to a tree. Uh, here's your gift. And here's your gift, and here's yours. Tree worship is simply a diversionary tactic to, to get away from serving God in order to serve self. Babel, the mother of harlots, started in the garden. It is, it is nothing but self-worship. That's all it is. Doesn't Christmas... And it's not... It's not Christ's mass that comes at the end of the year. All they did was, of course, drop one S and pull the two words together. That's what they did. It's not merely that it comes at the end of the year. It's the God of self that man worships all year long, and he has a festival at the end of the year. Of course, they call that the Saturnalia, or the festival of Saturn. In the ancient world, it started on December the 17th ended on December the 24th where they threw the Yule or the child in the fire, the Yule log in the fire. And the fire, they were trying to light up the world because the sun was burning out during the cold months of the year. So they could have crops in the spring so they wouldn't have famine. 
and famine was God's first judgment when they went after those other gods, and that's what Israel got involved in, and that's why all these kings fell into this. They all went to back to Baal, except for three of them. Who was that? David, Hezekiah, and Josiah. And that's the only righteous kings in Israel. And God said, I won't save all of Israel for their sake. He said, I'll destroy them. Look here. Go back to Genesis, third chapter. When man goes into tree worship, it doesn't mean he bows down to a tree and says, Hail to the old tree. He says, Hail to the old self. It's what he does. And what is repentance? Metanoia. Metanoia is turning away from self to God. That's what repent means. When you repent, you turn from self and say, Oh, God, be merciful to me and crush me, God, and cause me to follow your words. If you'll notice here, Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said... All you do is twist God's words and say he doesn't really mean what he says. What he says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He doesn't really mean that. He means something else. And since that's such a mysterious verse and he had no intentions for us to understand it, we need to dismiss it and not deal with it. That's crazy. He means exactly what he says, and those are all Greek words. And for 12 years, we spent 12 years on Wednesday night studying the doctrine of predestination. Every Wednesday night. Now, notice, he just simply put God's words in question. That's all you do. That way you get to do what you want. And you get involved in all that's in the world. You get involved in self. So, when people say we don't do it that way, if they bowed to a tree in Babylon, let's go to originally how they did it in the garden. First of all, you put God's words in question. That way you don't have to do what he says. And when he says, thou shalt not, over here is breaking the commandments of God. And when you break the commandments of God, you go into self, don't you? That's all you're doing. So when you get into tree worship, it's just, I want what I want. And you, if you can put the words of God in question, then you can interpret God's words the way you want to. And that way you can say, hath God said, well, he doesn't mean what he said. He meant something else. That's all that happened here. What happened in Genesis, the third chapter, is the same thing that happens when you quote Romans 8, 29 and quote predestination and somebody says, well, God doesn't mean that. He may have said that, but he does not mean it. Because that's what happened here, didn't it? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And they're going to die spiritually. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, you're not really going to die. God didn't mean that. That's all you do is put in question God's words about whatever. Christ, mass, or predestination. So tree worship puts in question God's words. For God hath, God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And see, well, God must want me to do that because he's given me the desire for that. Since he's given me the desire for that, my eyes will be open to the truth. I've had people say, well, God wants me to do that. Well, does that mean because you desire to go over and kill some guy who's done you wrong that God must want you to do that? God must want me to have her or have him. He's put that person as a desire in my heart. No, he doesn't. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, you already know good. Why do you need to know evil? And when the, in verse 6, equates with 1 John 2, 16. And when Israel got involved in this, when Israel got involved in this, in Samuel through Second Chronicles, they got involved in the tree worship because they wanted to redefine the law of God in their own lives, Baal and the grove. And they ignored God's laws about 
his sabbatical years like we talked about this morning. They ignored all of his laws. And they said, we believe in Jehovah God, but we don't believe that he means what he says. Do you actually think when Israel got involved in Baal, they didn't believe in Jehovah God anymore when all these kings fell into Baal worship? Certainly they believed in Jehovah God. They just said he didn't mean what he said. We don't do it that way. That's what they said. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, what did John say? All that's in the world? The lust of the flesh. Lust of, this is tree worship. Lust of flesh. Good for food. In the second thing, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, lust of the eyes. She saw a tree that was pleasant. Pleasant to the eye, didn't she? And remember what idolatry is? E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. -E -E it means to serve what you look at. So tree worship is when she saw in the tree, this is abstract language, this is figurative language. Number three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride. Pride. Now that word pride is A-L-A-Z-O-N-I-A. -A -A. It means self-esteem or self-confidence. Now what nation in the world, what system is preaching self-esteem? America. America. You can go out here to Opryland Hotel any Friday or Saturday night and you can listen to Zig Ziglar and you can listen to some motivational speaker tell you how you need self-esteem and the Bible doesn't teach that. That's of, the, that's of the world that is not of God, the pride of life. And she saw a tree that would make her wise and she could be wise in her own pride and her own self-conceits. That's tree worship. It's self-worship. You just redefine the words of God and you go after all that's in the world and you stick yourself a tree up and then you fight all through Christmas, all through December, and he gave us this and we spent $150 on them and they only spent $30 and bought us a toaster. It's all about self-worship is all it is. When you say you don't do it the way they did it in Babylon, you do exactly the way they did it in the garden. Don't you? It's covetousness. It's fighting over, I want something for me. Whenever I'm talking about tree worship, I'm not actually even thinking other than buying down to the tree, here's yours and here's yours. What I'm thinking about is the self-worship of Adam and Eve of the garden. And what is, what's the Christmas season about? What's it about? No, it's about, what are you going to buy for her? I hope they'd buy this for me. I want this, and I want that, and is this all there is? And let's go to this party, and let's drink, and let's get drunk, and they're having an office party, and the Christians are saying, we want to put our Jesus in that, and we want to be a part of that. That's idiocy. It's paganism. Well, this is the system that ruled Israel. And this is the system that perpetrated the fire worship. This is a chart I drew up. And here is the empires that ruled Israel. And Israel was within the parameters of all of these empires. Here's the, here's the Assyrian Empire in the purple. This is the, where the Assyrians ruled. And you have to remember... When it's an empire, that's about all the world that they knew of back then. There was no America, and there was no Russia, and there, was, there were a few pagan hordes going off through here. But this was the center of all the civilized world back then. So whenever you see these empires, the Mediterranean area, when you see the beast coming out of the sea, the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that's because the borders of the beast world system was on the was on the borders of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, here is the Babylonian Empire in the green. This is where Babylon ruled. Then in the Persian Empire, this was, it was a larger empire uh, in the borders of the orange. Then the Grecian Empire was in the brown here, in the brown. 
here, and then the Roman Empire was in the blue. It went all the way over here to, to uh, over to Hispania and to what we call Spain, over here to the borders of the what do we call the Atlantic Ocean there on the uh, on the eastern end of the uh, western end of the empire. And these were the systems that ruled Israel that God caused to come in and carry them away into captivity. And this is why God did this was because they got involved in this fire worship called Baal worship that Constantine brought into the church and called the mass. It's the same, and it was the tree worship. That's where the Christmas tree comes from. When, let me just read the Christmas tree for those of y'all who hadn't heard it. Look here at it, here in Jeremiah 10. And... It's not just in Jeremiah 10. It's everywhere you find the tree of the ancient world. She's called Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah 44. And God says, don't worship the Queen of Heaven. That was an old ancient title for Mileta or Aphrodite. And then when you look here in Jeremiah 10, this is what Israel was involved in. Who do you think Jeremiah's preaching to? This is their demise. Jeremiah's walking through the streets of Israel in 586 B.C. saying, Nebuchadnezzar's coming and he's going to destroy this nation. Because all the time you were a kingdom, you were involved in this. Look here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 10. Here's the Christmas tree. It is right here. Jeremiah 10. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. All the time they're a nation, their kings keep going back to Baal. After Jehu goes and after he kills the wife of Ahab, Jezebel, who brings this tree worship into Israel in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, Jehu went back to Baal. Why? I don't know. You know what man goes back to? It's real easy to fall back into self-worship. Remember, everything that Jesus preached was death to self. Repentance is turning away from self and turning to God. When you go back to self, you're forsaking God. When you're repenting, you're forsaking self. When you're confessing Christ, homo legeo, confess, you're of the same word as Christ and saying self must die. You'll either deny self or deny Christ. Deny means to contradict. What did Eve do when she went after the tree? She contradicted God. He said, thou shalt not. And she said, I think it's okay. I don't think you mean what you say. We don't do it that way. Isn't that unbelievable? Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh to you, O house of Israel, 10 and 1. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. He didn't say as long as you don't do it that way. Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, the garlands that are on the tree. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. You've got to nail it down, don't you? Because it don't move and it's not a god. That it move not, they are upright as the palm tree, but speak not, they must needs be born. They had to carry their tree God around. And in Layard's Nineveh, in Layard's Nineveh, he's one of the historians who went over into the Middle East, into all of these uh, digs over these archaeological areas of Assyria. He said that the tree in the ancient world, well, McClinican Song Strong says it was represented in the form of a cone, and it was triangular shaped, and they put a platform on it. And Mr. Layard says, since these tree deities were deified in the stars, that they always put a star at the top of the figure. I showed my boss those verses, and he says, that's your interpretation. <laughs> He's an ignoramus is what he is. What he is saying is, well, that doesn't mean what it says. He was saying the same thing as Eve in the garden. And when Mr. Layard said this, back in 1849, the Protestants, and Protestants in America were not celebrating Christmas on the whole. Very few people were celebrating Christmas in America. It was an old ancient drunken festival. 
Uh, Christmas did not become an American holiday till 1856. When Layard wrote that in 1849, he had no axe to grind with America. That's the, that's the Ashtaroth of the ancient world. Now, people get mad at me. What's unbelievable, you can take, I've got a library upstairs and we just lay it out and it'll be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books and we go through, oh, wait a minute, I got it. And one over, oh, I got it over here. And somebody, I got, here's, listen to this. And we can do this for 50 years with my library. And we, all of us can gather here and study the books I've got. Bring all my books down here, stack them all up along that wall, and pile them up, and we'll just start opening them. And we can't even exhaust my books in the next hundred years. What, what do you think they got in these libraries all over the world? Researching in, the, in all of these publications that we can go to when we order from all these publications around America. They're brutish. They're brutish. They are stupid. They are dull of hearing. They don't care. Somebody's got to go to hell. Yep, somebody's got to go to hell. And that's the vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction. That's true. And look here and look in, look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. I'll just show you another one here. Isaiah 40. This is what Israel served. Isaiah 40 here. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? He's telling Israel, who are you going to liken God to? One of these gods that you serve? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workmen, these are the guys who work in iron, and they're making these tree idols. The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and cast a silver chain. Those are the garlands you put around a Christmas tree. And it has evolved over the years. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation, the poorest man chooses the tree that will not rot. Huh? A tree that will not rot? What is that? That's a cedar tree, isn't it? An evergreen, a cedar. And in the pagan world, in the Scandinavian countries, they worshiped Yule, they worshiped Yule and they went to the, what they called the Wassailing Bowl, W-A-S-S-A-I-L-I-N-G. They had a great big bowl that goes back to Semiramis in the ancient world when she had a bowl that she made the whole world drunk with the wine of her fornication, which is a picture of the harlot of Babylon. They had a Wassailing Bowl where they all got together and got drunk and they served the sun god and they said in these Scandinavian countries, their sun god was Thor, and Thor's hammer was, was the swastika. That was, well, I got it wrong here. That was Thor's hammer, was the swastika. And he went around slaughtering all of his enemies with that, and the sun god was Yule there. And they said in the Scandinavian countries, when they got together at the winter solstice on December the 22nd, they said all of those trees out there, those evergreens, the trees that would not rot, since they would not rot and they could live through the winter and through the sub-zero, through 40 degrees below zero, they said that those were magical trees, so therefore they took the holly and the greenery from these trees and they strung it around their pagan temples and around their houses, and they sang the old wassailing bowl drunken song, deck the halls with boughs of holly. <laughs> That's idiocy. That is a pagan, drunken, old Saxon wassailing bowl song. I was watching, uh, I like some of the classics. I like to read all kinds of books. And I was watching... Uh, I believe it was Ivanhoe. It was Ivanhoe one night on one of the classical channels, and they showed us the Saxons gathering around a wassailing bowl, and they started singing some old ancient drunken song, and one guy had the wreath around, had a crown upon his head, and had the holly on his head, and I thought, golly, there it is right there. Go in one of these 
I think it was PBS, and they were showing it as one of those classic things, and I thought, that is good. I like that. They know what it is. And that's what Israel was involved in, and that's why God kept destroying. God said, if the kings of Israel go after this sun worship, after this tree worship, did they? Did they have a tree that would not rot? Look here in Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. How much time do I have, Mike? Huh? 20? I'm going to move out of this and move back into Ahab and Jezebel here in a moment. Isaiah 44. Ah, let me see here. This is Isaiah preaching to Israel about their apostasy. And who is it that ran Israel? It was these kings. It was all these evil kings. That's why God scattered them. That's why they're fighting over the land. Do you realize that Christmas, the pagan origins of Christmas is directly related to the Palestinians and the Israelis fighting over the West Bank and over the Gaza Strip. And when you say that to somebody, they're going, huh? The reason for them fighting over that land right now over there is because Israel celebrated the Christ Mass, Baal worship, the tree worship of the garden. That's a fact. That's not even an opinion. That's a fact. And we're studying about that on Sunday morning. We're studying that as we go through the through this Israel system all the time they were a kingdom. We've taken two and a half years to get down to Ahab here and get down to we're about to go into Jehoshaphat here in southern Judah. It's taken us two years to get to that point and just to talk about these things. Look here in Isaiah 44 down here in verse 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you Israel from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? They were going after Baal and the Ashtaroth of the grove. Ashtaroth were the tree deities. That's what the grove was. Yea, there is no God. I know not any. They that make a graven image in Israel, the priests of God were making graven images, tree goddesses, are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. They don't even know the truth. These people that are serving this system of self and reinterpreting the Word of God. Who hath formed a God? Or molten, a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed. The fellow was the one who felled the trees. And the workmen, they are of men. These were the men who worked in the iron works and would beat out the platforms for the trees. Let them all be gathered together. They would make, instead of making the garlands in this little paper things that we put on them, they made them in gold and silver metal. They did a better job than we do. Let them stand up. Of course, they didn't just keep them at the season of the Saturnalia. They kept them all year long. Yet they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. The smith, the blacksmith, the guy who worked in iron to make these garlands to go around the trees, with the tongs both worketh in the coals. When you think of a blacksmith, you think of the guy that takes the tongs and puts the horseshoe him into the fire and beats it out straight and puts it on the horse. These were smiths that worked in the same kind of thing to build the tree gods for Israel and to make the silver chains and the gold chains to go around the tree gods or tree goddesses. And fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line, with a measuring line. He fitteth it with planes. He works diligently upon this God. He said, who, what did God say? Who makes a God? Up there in verse 8 and 9, who comes up and makes a God? 
and he marketh it out with the compass and maketh it after the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. I was watching or read an article about some guy in India. He had a god which came out of the fire worship system and he had a statue of a god and he went out and rented an apartment for that statue <laughs> so he could keep it in the house. And where do we put our tree goddess? In the house, don't we? Now, I've, I've spent 45 years studying Jewish history. I know what they're doing. I can spend, how long can I stand up here and preach Jewish history if I don't get down tonight? If I don't walk out until I collapse, I'll be here till in the morning and we'll be going all through First and Second Samuel, Kings and Chronicles and all through Ezra and Nehemiah. And we'll be going through all the prophecies of the prophets and we'll go through Haggai and Habakkuk and we'll get into Amos and Hosea and Joel. And they'll prophesy against Israel for having gone after these gods and goddesses. And Hosea will say that, is, that Ephraim, northern Israel, has offended in Baal in the 13th chapter of Hosea. Verse 13, He fitteth it with plains, and marketh it out with a compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man that may remain in the house. He heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak. Of course, oak is A-L-L-O-N, Alon, and it comes from A-L-L-A-H, Allah. And they perverted and twisted this system, and Allah was the, was the crescent moon, and, and the moon goddess was interchangeable with Venus, and sometimes, and they polluted it as they went through the centuries, and sometimes the moon god, goddess was a god. It was male, and it was Allah, and when it was female, uh, it was Venus, Venus or Aphrodite or so forth, and it was, a, it was androgynous. It was male and female. And wherever you find the crescent moon, the fezes of the, of the Shriners are on the temples of the Arabs, are on their hats. It's all the same thing. And another name for Allah was M-E-N-I-Y, and that word means number, and the moon numbered the seasons, and he was called the numberer. I made that up. You know that, don't you? I just came up with this word, mene. I made it up. It's your interpretation. Yeah. I'm making up all these facts. Ain't I good at making up names in history? People say I make it up. I study my brains out. I walk around with a book with me all the time, and I open up books, and Mary will say, what are you doing? I say, shh, be quiet, Mary. I'm looking for something. I'm looking. I go to my library, and I'm going... You need to see me in my library. I'm going in and going, uh, wait a minute, where's that book? I'm going, I've lost one of my books. <laughs> and I'm looking for it. I'm going, oh, wait a minute. Wait, it's, maybe it's in here and in here. And I'm going, <clears throat> I'm going here, going, Phew. let's see if I can find this. I'm going, wait a minute, where is that? And get out on the floor and look at this book. If you'll study like a freak, people will call you crazy. <laughs> you'll study like a crazy man. Listen, he's crazy. But in, compared to the world, it takes somebody crazy to dig through all of this information to find it. Doesn't it? A man called me crazy for being married to you. Yeah. Now, I know that I don't look like a professor. I wear my cheap tennis shoes and, I, and my jeans. I know I don't look like... I cannot help it. God's given me a hunger for information. I love information. I like information on anything. Just tell me something that's interesting, that's informative. Truth. Truth, yeah. I don't care. Tell me about the Red Baron. I read five books on Baron Manfred von Richthofen. I want to find out who killed him, who shot him down. I want to find out why men live like that. I've read all these books on mafia, read all these books on the old ancient Western people. I read all these books when I was in high school. I read 129 books, probably half of them were World War II section that we had. I want to know about this fighter pilot, this guy, this submarine, this ship. I just have a hunger for information. I like it. You know what information does to you? It makes you powerful. 
It makes great big men, strong men, petrified of you. Because when you open your mouth and start giving them information, they go, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll go into the gym up there before I had this heart attack. I'd go in there and start talking to some big guy and say, listen to me. And they'll be going, <clears throat> looking down their chest at me, going, kind of backing up, going. <laughs> it scares men. Knowledge is power, isn't it? When you have knowledge, the more knowledge you have, and if the kids can learn that when you grow up, it's hard for you to be conned, isn't it? Yeah. So you hear some guy rattling something off and say, that's idiocy. People get mad at me when, I'm, when preachers come on TV. I say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. As fast as some of them talk, they spew out a idiocy. And they're famous and people like them. But that certainly don't make them right. Somebody, that guy said last night that called, he said, you mean all these other people are wrong and you're right? I said, I think that's what they said to Noah. You mean all these people are wrong and you're just the eight of y'all are right? Just you, Mr. Noah? Yeah. Well, I thought it was a majority. Well, I'm sorry, but that ain't it. <laughs> now, look here. Isaiah 44. Majority died. Huh? Majority died. Yeah, the majority the majority died. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's will to give you the kingdom. Little bitty flock. Few will find the narrow gate, not the majority. That's crazy. The Bible says that, but it never occurs to people to read that. He heweth him down, verse 14. Heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash. And the rain doth nourisheth it, then shall it be for a man to burn the same tree. Here's the uses of it. For he will take thereof and warm himself, yea. He kindleth it and bit and baketh bread, yea. He maketh the God out of the same wood and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part, part thereof in the fire with the part thereof. He eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god. Even his graven image he falleth down unto it that started in the Garden of Eden. And the way they originally did it, they went after self. And worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. That's what Israel did. And it started in the garden when they went after self. All a man read, when a man invents his own God, he just doesn't want to do what God says, and he simply says, Hath God said? God don't mean what he says. You can go to the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what it is. Look here. Read that next verse. Okay. They have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes, and they cannot see in their hearts, and they cannot understand. These are the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, he's given them eyes that they can't see and ears that they can't hear, lest they should be converted, and I should heal them there in the 13th chapter of Matthew when he quoted those words from Isaiah 6. I don't want them. They're not mine. That's predestination. Look back here. I've not got time to go into it, but I've been on this subject back in 1 Kings. I'll just introduce you to it. I'm just about out of time. But look here in 1 Kings. So when you're talking about tree worship, you're not talking about actually saying, hail to the old tree. You're talking about self-worship. When people say we don't do it that way, do you do it the way, the original way they did it in the garden? Self, all that's in the world. That's what man does. That's true tree worship. That's figurative, abstract language. You go after all that's in the world. You go after self and you don't repent. You don't turn from self. There's two messages in the Bible. There's Jesus and the other Jesus. 
The Jesus of the Bible says, take your cross and die, die to self. You have to be hated. You have to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. You have to deny self. You have to suffer for truth. And you have to die for it. And the other Jesus says, no fulfilled self. Go after the tree. You can still believe in God. I just don't mean what I say. That's the devil. He's the other Jesus of 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. Look here. 1 Kings, I'll just read this. Here's where it came into Israel. Here's where it came into Israel. Ahab ascends the throne after his father Amri dies. In verse 31, Ahab, king of northern Israel, marries Jezebel. Her father is Ethbel, a priest of the tree goddess, a priest of Baal. Yeah. Verse 31, chapter 16, 1 Kings, it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, when Jeroboam brought golden calf worship into Israel. It was a light thing that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal or Hercules or Mithra. Those were all generic terms for the same worship of Nimrod who started the Babylonian worship of fire and the tree, the reinstitution of Adam and Eve worship of the garden. And worshiped him and did something that had never done been done in Israel and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in northern Israel or Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, an Asherah, an Ashtaroth. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. When he went after... Now, if God did more to provoke God to Israel when he went after the tree God and went after the sun God Baal, what do you think he is going to do to America? America is a Babylonian system. We've got a false Jesus alive in America. The preachers are going after a Jesus who doesn't require repentance, requires no self-denial, requires no death to self, requires no suffering for righteousness' sake, wants everybody to be popular and happy. This is not a popularity contest with God. You have to be hated. And when, when Jesus said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you, do you think that the world will hate you when he said, accept Christ as your personal Savior, and we'd like to invite you to let Jesus into your heart. Let God do something in you, and you're just a slug. And we'd like to give this invitation and let Jesus be Lord of your life and Everyone come because God loves everybody and we're going to have a Christmas play here next week and have this nice Jesus here and he likes everybody and we all like you and you all like us. Now, is that going to get you hated? <laughs> that nice Jesus? No. When you start telling people this is pagan, this is self-worship and you have to repent and you must be hated, this is the message that will make you hated, isn't it? Yeah. If the world has to hate you, Jesus said in John 15, if the world hated me, it will hate you. If it persecuted me, it will persecute you. If it killed me, it'll kill you. You tell the truth, you'll die for it. I would be the biggest fool in the world to say this in some basement of some house, I'm either a real stupid man or this is the truth. I'd have to be a real fool to preach this. And the fact that I realize I'd have to be a fool to preach it proves that I'm not a fool if it wasn't true. You wouldn't... Does it make any sense that a man would preach this if it's not true? Doesn't even make any sense... It doesn't even make any sense that a man that has half sense would preach it. Much, much less a man that's got good sense would preach it. <laughs> a man with half sense certainly would not preach it. It'll get you hated. You preach predestination. You preach death to self and the daily cross. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Sometimes a guy will call me and say, you are preaching to these preachers. I said, look. I said to this guy last night, I said, hey, 
you're saying all these guys are popular and they're liked. The Bible says, whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Yeah, but you said, I said, I didn't say that. James said that. <laughs> I'm just irritated out of my mind. Jesus said that. Don't get mad at me. Yeah, cuss God. Grab him at the, by the collar of the judgment. Say, I don't like what you said. But kill the prophet Kill the messenger, and the message will go away. That's what they thought I'd do if they killed Jeremiah. If we can kill Jeremiah, the message will go away, and God don't know how to send another preacher. <laughs> well, yeah, except for Daniel and Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi and Nehemiah and Ezra and all these other guys. It's like a stone bin Laden. Killed Jeremiah. Yeah, you killed. <laughs> they actually believe they killed Osama bin Laden. This Arab thing is going to go away. I said this before. They're not through with America. No. Mark that down on your calendar. We're going to see terrorism in America before it's over with. They hate the fact that we're supporting Israel in their possession of the land. And, and if, if the United States changes their policy on Israel, I'm not changing mine, and they're going to hate me worse. Because if Bush... And Powell and these guys passed laws. God said the land belongs to me. I gave it to Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. Ishmael, the Arabs are out. Esau, the Arabs are out. It's my land, he said there in the 26th chapter of Leviticus. I give it to who I will. And it's not to be bought or sold. And he gave it to the descendants of Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. And we've supported them in that possession of that land since May 14, 1948. Let me tell you. All nations will turn against Israel. That's what it says. Now, I don't know exactly what the United States is going to do. And it, let's just say this. They do come over here. They start exploding some bombs in these shopping centers and some of these buildings. The United States may take a second look on supporting Israel if that happens and the United States turns on them, I'm going to keep preaching what I'm preaching, and they may kick me off the radio and TV, and they may come up with some new laws. If they do, that's when the church, the true church, will go into persecution. It's just like Phyllis was asking me today, how can the church go into persecution? If the, if the laws of the United States and our political stand with Israel changes, and the thing that could change it, if you heard a, if you heard a, a terrorist come over here, they were talking on TV the other day on C-SPAN about having suitcase-sized nuclear warheads. They said they've already got some of them in some of the foreign countries. You can pick it up and carry it into a shopping center. You ain't just going to blow up the shopping center. You're going to blow up the whole city. Yeah. What about the German bombs that they have to, they'll have to destroy the whole city to get rid of the radiation? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to tell you. What's, I said that they're coming back. They have to come back. Anyone who supports Israel and their stand for the land, they are enemies of the descendants of Ishmael. They believe they own the land. God said, I gave it to Jacob. Jacob's name is Israel. They're in the 28th chapter of Genesis, and that is not going to change. The reason Israel went after, the reason Israel's been scattered is because they went after the fire worship, the tree worship. The reason they're back is because God has brought them back and sustained them through every society of the ancient world. What I'm saying is true. If what I'm saying is not true, throw your Bible away. There is no truth. What I'm saying is true. I mean, I study these factual things. I pick up my, my encyclopedias. I've got a dozen of different Jewish and, and historical encyclopedias of religion and by Hastings and McClinic and Strong and Smith and all the rest of these guys. And I'm digging stuff out of it every day. And I know the truth about this. I know who owns the land. God took the land away from Israel. He brought them back. We're sitting on the verge of eternity. And it's all because Israel got involved in this Baal worship. And it started in the garden. Tree worship is when you go after self. It's just reinventing what God said and say he doesn't mean what he says. It says, hath God said. And when you say, hath God said, did God say you couldn't do this? Do you think Satan knew what God said. Yeah, he knew what he said. He was sitting listening. He didn't, when he said, hath God said, he's wanting to put it in doubt our minds about what God meant. He said it and he meant it. 
Don't say he don't mean predestination when Ephesians 1 and 11 says, We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You can call me crazy if you want to, but you'll stand in judgment before God. I'm not going to change what I believe about the Word of God. You can call me crazy and come shoot me if you want to. God has convicted my heart to start this ministry and say these words this hard. You want to deal with, you're not dealing with me. I'm nothing but a conduit. I'm just a pipe. The message of God is flowing through me. He sent me. He put a hunger in my heart from the time I was a kid for information. And I love this information about the Word of God. And I'm going to preach it the way it says it. And I do not care what happens to me. We're going to talk truth here at Grace and Truth Ministries from now on. I'm sick of the lies. I'm fed up with it up to here. I'm fed up with my father's lies. My father's a Baptist preacher. He wouldn't know the truth if you put it on a freight train and run over him with it. He didn't know nothing about the truth. I'm talking about my father, Hollis Brown, did not know the truth. Now, if you'll stand against your father, your parents, what did Jesus say? Unless a man hate his father, mother, sister, brother, and himself also. Anything that does not embrace the truth of the word of God, I hate it. Let's pray. God help us. Lord, your word is true. We know it. Lord, preaching this makes us weary because our family turns from us, our friends. You said our enemies will be those of our own household. And that men will have to hate us and persecute us and they'll have to want to kill us just like they did you and Paul and John and James and Thomas and Timothy and the rest of the apostles. God help us. Crush us under your hand. Deal with our hearts and our lives. And God give me strength because sometimes I wear out I get tired and I get very weary. I need you. Lord, if you'll give me strength, we'll continue this ministry and I will not back down. I'll keep on, no matter who forsakes or walks away. If you'll give me strength, I'll keep doing it because you started this ministry and when it stops, you'll stop it. Forgive us of our sin. Lord, let us not go after the tree goddess of self and fight our enemies, Lord, just as you did for your holy men of Israel. But you said we've got to remove the gods out of our life and then you fight for us. So, God, this God of self that we serve, that we've invented in order to keep from abiding by your word, Lord, destroy it and fight for us, and we will praise you and give you glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh. I'll be back to Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah next Sunday night. No, I'm going, I'm going to get back to them. I get, no, I'm going to get to them. I hope we can see what this God is itself. Jeff, how do we end up with two books of Kings? Huh? How do we end up with two books? Well, they're just one following the other. The first book of Kings start with Solomon. Huh? Yeah, they do follow in exact order. You come out of 1 Kings. You start 1 Kings with Solomon being king. You end with Jehoshaphat being king of northern Israel, uh, southern Judah and Ahab being king of, of, of northern Israel. And then you go in Elijah. Elijah is the prophet in that time period. And then you go into 2 Kings and Elijah is still the prophet. And then you go into Elisha being the prophet. Elisha the prophet. And you move through the rest of the kings of Israel. Go up through Jehu and Jehoshaphat and 
and you go through Athaliah and all the Uzziah and the rest of these. Hey, what are you doing, Phil? What's going on? What's going on? This is my friend, Matt. Hey, Matt, how you doing? It's good to meet you too, Matt. We're glad you're here. What'd you think all that? Was that a lot of stuff? A lot of like a steamroller. Got like getting like, like getting hit with a tidal wave. Lots of information. I got it all on paper, so. Oh, do you? <laughs> okay. Okay. A lot of stuff. What I'm trying to do is tell the truth. That's all. And uh, people are not facing the truth in America. What are you doing? You doing okay? I'm glad you're here. How's your paw doing? He's doing pretty good. Easy, nice, good. Yeah. Can you show the Catholic book to me real quick? Yeah, it's a, it's a, this is a book for Catholics. This is not a book. And what's so amazing, this is not a book against Catholicism. It's for Catholics. It's got some unbelievable the things that I say, they will even bear out. You go into, like, for instance, let me see, I'll show you something. I really wanted to know about you. I, I, I can't. I didn't quite get time to take down the notes on the on the nuns how they originated. Well, they started with the Vestal Virgins. All of that was changed uh -huh. when Constantine started the Roman Church. Here's Queen of Heaven. Uh -huh. Mary's being crowned Queen of Heaven. Well, the Queen of Heaven was the old ancient title of Mileta, or the female mediatrix, and you find her in the fort in the 44th chapter of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, "Do not worship the Queen of Heaven." They said. Do not pour out drink offerings to her. And they said, we will worship the queen of heaven and we will offer uh, cakes unto her. And that word cake, kavon, means sacrificial wafer. That's the Eucharist. That's what was brought into the... But here, look here. This is really interesting. This is a Catholic book. Listen to this. Do you know the Roman queen of heaven was said to give birth to her son Mars? They even go into the mythology without sacrificing her virginity. Goddesses and even gods giving birth through means other than sexual union are common in ancient literature. I mean, and the, and the, the fleur de lis or the flower of the lily and the swastika was the Boy Scout symbol and she was identified with the lily. That's where you get the Easter lily. They'll tell you this is really... That's amazing. This is a Roman. The Roman Catholics will tell you, they'll even tell you that what they were eating just blows my mind that the Catholics <laughs> know the truth, but the Baptists that I was raised around don't know and, it. And they don't want to act like they really believe this. They, yeah, oh, people don't the really Baptists will say, oh, they don't believe that. And the Catholics say, yes, we yes, do. We this guy's pretty perceptive. We were talking probably about three months ago, and he was telling me how it seemed like all the stories were the same. Well, the they are. World. And I said, Look at yeah. that. I said, you need to talk to this guy. Look at that. There's the Eucharist. There's the one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight. There's the eight points of the swastika. That is the fire wheel of the ancient world. It comes out of the same thing. That's the nature wheel. And then you go, they'll even tell you. I'll tell people. They'll say, look here. The Mass or the Eucharist, Thanksgiving, was first celebrated as a meal. What they were eating when Jesus said, take the, eat, this is my body, they were eating the last Passover. They even say that's what it was. They'll even tell you in this that it was the Passover. It just amazes me. The Catholics know more than the Baptists that I was raised around, than my Baptist preacher father. And you can find the facts if you want the facts. We've got... I mean, I've got a library upstairs that will just knock you down. All the information I've got. I mean, it's the amount of information I've got, I can't research it all myself. And I'm buying books all the time through various publications. They'll tell you the truth. In fact, you can go down to... You can go down to Walden Books and get you a catechism of the Catholic Church, and they'll tell you the truth in here. They'll tell you, look here, they will say, they're talking about the Eucharist all through here. We'll see you in the morning. I love you, yeah. If not, uh, if it's rain, Tuesday. Okay. I love you. I Take care. About the brown. Okay, well, whatever y'all. Now, look here. He says, uh, let me show you this. This is a Catholic. You, this is a Catholic uh, 
catechism. This is what you buy if you're a Catholic to be taught the catechism. Uh, and then he talks about the apostles saying, this is a hard saying, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Who can learn it? By celebrating the Last Supper with his apostles in the course of the Passover meal. They tell you it was the Passover. It was not crackers and grape juice. Even the Catholics know that. Matthew 26, 17, they said, Where wilt thou that we should prepare to eat the Passover? They eat the Passover. You had four things present at the Passover. Lamb without blemish, unleavened bread for seven days. You had four cups. The third cup was called the cup of blessing. You had bitter herbs. All that has become spiritual now. So these, these virgins here, uh, Melita, what uh, goddess was that? Was that a Melita means media trick. She was the female mediator, and they said in the ancient world that she could assuage the wrath of her son. Well, that's what they put into the Roman Catholic Church and said that Mary can assuage the wrath of Jesus. That's why they pray to Mary as the media tricks. So these, these virgins, were, were they temple, like temple prostitutes? The, thing, no, the Vestal virgins, their job was to keep the fires of Mithra going. They could not let the fire go out. That was one of the worst things that they could do. They kept the eternal flame burning, and that was their job. In the, in the temple of Mithra in Rome. Like the, like the nuns today uh -huh. uh, keep the... That's why you need, look here, that's why you need a set of these. You can look up Vestal Virgins in here and it'll tell you. That's why you need a set of McClinic and Strong. Okay. Because you can look up nearly anything under the sun if you know what to look up under. You can look up the Vestal Virgins in here. They'll tell you what they're about, what they did. And there are other books. These are 200 and, what are they, $235? They're back to $200. Back to $200. Plus shipping. That Plus is 15. dirt cheap. When they weren't publishing them back five years ago, if you found a used set, they'd call you seven, cost you seven or $800. Did you pay them Right now, and we don't know how long they're going to publish them. Really? No, I bought a set for down here. I got a set upstairs and a set down here. So I can get right to it real quick. up on it. show somebody something. They'll give you more information. You... You cannot exhaust this the rest of your life. Impossible. You'll be reading on it from now on, and you'll be reading. I love this, uh, the SU volume down. Yeah, you can just, the amount of information is just so phenomenal. Just, you'll get into theism, tetrarchs, tabernacle, the temple. Tarsus, you want to find out where Paul come from? There's Talmud. There's a section on the Talmud. It'll tell you all about what it's about, how it come out of the, the old Halakha and Haggadah, the verbal and oral laws. But then somebody will just tell you, these are written by man. Yeah, this is this history. This is written by man. Yeah, this is history is what it is. I mean, well, it's written by a man. What about the Botanica? What does she rely on a silk re a resource? She read a thing. She read on the little info things you get over the internet. You want to know about information? You won't exhaust this one volume, much less all of them. There's a million cop outs to it. Yeah. That's your opinion is what people always say when you give them facts. That's your opinion. Well, okay. At the judge, but tell God that's his opinion. Yep. That's what they probably tried to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think they, I don't think they will like one preacher that. said, if you don't like what God said, when you get to the judgment, grab him by the collar and tell him, hey, God. You know. Okay. I love you, man. I'm glad you guys come. Good to see you, too. Come back and see me, okay? Well, we've got... Tons of tapes with information, with tons of information. But this is one huge picture. You got to see the whole picture. Tell your pa, I said, hey, tell him to come with you one night. Okay? Y'all take care. Okay? All right. And preach the word. We love you guys. Take care.